today. My name is Stephanie Smith, and um, I'm the Director of Residential Operations over at Invesco. And I have the pleasure of um, moderating this, uh, this conversation today. It's something that I feel very passionate about, have um, really built a career around both in the US and here. And I'm really pleased to have my, uh, my very just illustrious peers up here um, to, to have a chat with um, about the lead to lease process. And how are we really getting it right? How are we benchmarking? And how are we, as my mentor used to say, inspecting what we expect? So I'll turn over to Seb first, and we'll go through introductions. Hi, good afternoon. Thank you for joining us. My name is Sebastian Moritz. I'm the director of Moricon. Uh, and today I'm talking about Morricone Mystery Shopping. Uh, so to help customers in their journey from the click on the website all the way to a successful viewing and then hopefully to a lettings contract. So we monitor certain touch points during that uh, customer experience uh, uh, journey. Uh, hi everyone, my name is Nick Hammond. I'm the head of builder at Devil Smith. We are a global executive search firm based in London. Hello, Todd Marler. I'm the Senior Director of Operations for Graystar. Uh, oversee the BTR portfolio for UK and Ireland. And Catherine Russell from John Lewis, Head of Build to Rent. So, probably not very well qualified to talk from a customer experience in the Build to Rent market, but here to give a retail perspective and what we're going to apply to when we do launch our first Build to Rent scheme. Uh, I'm Deborah Udolf, I'm from Say, we're a consultancy business that um, provide advice on operations uh, and uh, cost of running buildings, but for this session I'm here um, predominantly uh, for Hearsay, which is a business or bit of the business that we launched a year ago, which again is also a mystery shopping business, but we um, created a benchmark uh, so that um, build train operators can compare themselves against their competitors, um, specifically focusing on the lead to lease experience. Thank you very much. So, um, at first I'd like to start out with discussing a little bit about the importance of the lead to lease process and being able to monitor that. And really I'd like to tap into the operator view. So, you know, um, Todd, why don't we start with you and thinking about the impact on brands uh, as you're developing that and also how that impacts your lease up velocity on the assets? Yeah, I mean, obviously tracking your lead to lease is very, very important. Uh, one of the things that we look at, um, just as a, from a metrics perspective, is really understanding, you know, how many leads do we get and how many of those leads then can we convert into actual tours and traffic and then how many of those tours and pieces of traffic do we then convert into an actual lease. Really important to understand those numbers and then understand um, you know, what is the expectation and benchmark so that when we look at a lease up, we really can focus on understanding how many of each of those things do we know we need to get and then how are we going to do it. Um, and then really important for us is then focusing on what works in the conversion process, right? So we know the numbers, that's important, but then really analyzing what's working to get those conversions to happen. So how do we get that initial lead to understand that it's a qualified piece of traffic to then understand that that piece of qualified traffic is going to become um, you know, a tour and then how do we make sure that once it's a tour we're really capitalizing on that experience to convert it to a lease. Um, sounds really simple and easy but in reality it is quite complicated and, and doesn't always work the way you think it's going to but um, definitely something that's very important. And, and Catherine, I mean off of the back <coughs> of that, you know, Bringing in that retail perspective, obviously John Lewis is known for quality, good customer service. So, you know, how are you going to think about that as you're building your brand and you're starting to build up even something as simple as how you approach qualifying um, a client and how to get that through the sell process to make sure you're getting the people in the right home? Yeah, so I think um, for us it's all about trust and how do you build that trust from the very beginning. So. We were talking when we kind of got together as a group around customer service and what does that look like. And I think for John Lewis, the customer experience is basically the bridge link between the brand and the operations. And how do you bring that bridge link and that customer service and the brand and the operations to life with real integrity? And that's what we're all about and that's what we view the customer experience. And that's where we start um, from day one. And I'd say that um, from our perspective, um, 
you know, we talked about this as a group as well, there is no silver bullet to trying to create an amazing customer experience or trying to build on that trust. It's about leaning into your ecosystem of services that feed into both your brand and your operation and making sure that all of that talks to each other. So making sure there aren't any barriers, making sure that you've got seamless systems, etc. Those are the things that from our perspective on a retail side, we think we can apply to the build to rent um, operation to try and help that lead to lease in terms of the starting journey. We then talked about, um, we've got a principle of 12 steps. Um, we were talking about whether it sounded like we were going to AA or not. Um, <laughs> but um, we've got a 12 steps um, proposition really, which talks about the customer journey, which thinks about, and I, I, I suspect none of this is new news to you, it's just in the John Lewis terminology effectively. Um, but we think about, you know, where does a customer or a resident, for example, start their journey? It's from the moment they think about when am I going, what I want to rent, and what does that look and feel like, and how do you go through each of those steps to when they actually then exit, and understanding what that customer really wants. Um, so we think about all of those journeys, and then we go into <coughs> assurance. So the assurance slide piece for us is about how do you know that the vision that you've set out from a customer experience perspective is actually being delivered? And that's where we step into the kind of um, mystery shopping, which is one tool where we kind of assess whether actually, you know, is what we're delivering correct? But I suppose from a John Lewis perspective, we recognise that mystery shopping has a real place and real added value, but it has got its limitations as well. So we've got about four other steps that we go through that look at actually how customers perceiving what we're doing. So the first one is we, we go out to about 8,500 customers each month and test whether you know what we're doing is what we expect to be delivering. Now that's a very kind of proactive approach and we've got a reactive approach where actually we take feedback from our customers on an ad hoc basis. We kind of pull all of that together and we look at data insight, so understanding actually what is that all telling us and then it's all about closing the loop for us, about understanding that actually loads of people, all of us fill in surveys all the time. How do we know that any of that information is actually making a difference? So it's all about closing that loop with customers as well. And that's what we are starting to add into our journey at the moment. Sorry, I feel like I've <laughs> you know, rambled on there. No, that was, fa that was fantastic. Thank you very much. Um, in, you know, what I'd be interested in, in exploring a little bit, Seb, if I can um, tap into your very experienced brain, you know, as we're thinking about how we can benchmark and set standards across the industry, how, do, how are you also building in the brand element around mystery shops, for instance, so that maybe there are the baseline questions, but off of the back of that, you also have, um, you know, you're building in Catherine's requirements for additional things that she wants to make sure her teams are conveying. Yeah, it's, it, it's a, there was a tricky question when we started looking at, at a questionnaire that is actually <coughs> meaningful. And so I come from a hospitality background and I'm familiar with uh, JD Power or, or Medallia. And one thing that stuck was the experience and in about 2007, leading hotels of the world changed from a purely standard tick box uh, approach to uh, you know, where the spoon is on the saucer in the cafe or is there a, a, a logo on, on, a, on a piece of paper or a napkin to how did that experience make me feel? And fast forward now to, to build to rent, um, I believe that the customer already knows where they want to go. They know about the rate structure, but how is, how is this touchy-feely thing that in the bricks and mortar world of build to rent is still sort of on the sideline and we then f looked at standards that are very easy to understand because they talk to us. Uh, when, when we talk about the customer journey, how quickly was the organization actually back in contact with the prospect lead? Am I waiting hours or days or weeks? W what, what is norm? So we came up with 10 points where we believe it makes sense to incorporate them and because they are measurable. There's currently in the industry not a benchmark standard across, so you want to make sure those are hospitality-driven or service-driven standards that are easily um, applied to any building, but you can measure them, but in the, at the core is how did the interaction make me feel as a customer? Because when they knock on your door, they've done the homework, um, they want to basically interview you whether your brand is actually talking back 
to them that they say, you know what, this is a great building. Everything has been wonderfully done. They used my name, they followed up, they actually had a my sales pitch. And that's when we believe you have then a measurable uh, standard vehicle to actually push forward in, in, in your Latin strategy. And, and I think that that's a, a key <coughs> element too, is, is talking about that journey and about building that rapport, and to Catherine's point, the trust as well, with our different residents as they're coming in the door if long before they sign those contracts. So Deborah, I'd like to um, you know, tap into your mind about understanding benchmarking ability along with the importance of understanding where we've lost customers um, as you're measuring. Okay, so um, uh, just to explain, so our benchmark asks some standard questions and we also have specific questions that fit in with the, the brand standards of the people that we're working for. Um, and one of my favorite questions is, is uh, some of it's quantitative and some of it's qualitative. So for example, and a question, one of my favorites is, you know, did the mystery shopper build a rapport? And, and what we see with that is that um, lots of things can go wrong on a, on a viewing, but if they've built a rapport, they're more likely to recommend um, the site to a friend than if they don't build a rapport. So they can see an amazing scheme and not build a rapport and that makes it less popular. But I've got um, some stats here. So we're building the data for our next benchmark, which will be launched in January. So we've been quite active doing um, quite a lot of mystery shops at the moment. Um, it's quite difficult because as we all know, there's not a lot of availability. Uh, so that makes mystery shopping quite challenging. So we do always um, check that there's availability. So I'll just give you some stats, um, which will come out more in the benchmark, but um, currently um, responses to inquiries are really poor. So over 50% of our mystery shoppers um, in the last month did not get a response from their inquiry. And our process is an email, and then we wait three days, and then we do three phone calls, and then we walk in. So that um, could be a, 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 a symptom of the market, but um, uh, Catherine and I were talking, you know, that, that's, that's pretty, um, uh, shocking um, and, and that doesn't include sites where there was just no availability. 30% um, of um, our shoppers um, were told about environmentally friendly or sustainable features of the development. So that's only 30% and, and if you've been in other sessions there's been a lot about sustainability today um, but one of the things I was on the circular economy panel is about um, explaining to the customer the benefits of build to rent because generally the buildings are, are, are you know, th that's a big tick that um, the industry can offer. Um, generally in terms of feedback, um, once someone is doing a mystery shop then it gets to be really excellent and it's much improved from last year. Um, and someone said, um, I could definitely imagine living here, it seemed like a friendly community based complex that listens to the residents, the price was affordable and it was pet friendly. The guide made the whole tour fun and memorable. She was extremely friendly, and I could tell she believed in what she was selling. The lack of follow-up was a shame, though. And I think that that is another thing that we find, is that, um, that there's, it's expensive um, to find an applicant and to do a tour. Uh, but again, like last year, 50% of people never got a follow-up. We're still working on the stats, but um, it's still it's pretty poor. Um, we asked if they were told about site events, Wi-Fi included in the rent, the benefits of build to rent, what we would call the benefits. Um, and more of these are told about um, the higher the perception is of value for money. So the more people do explain the benefits, then we get a much better score for value for money. Um, we haven't, we're still collating stats on how many people are told, but it's been pretty low in the past. Um, and our respondents' perception of whether a scheme um, offered a sense of community is really strongly linked to seeing the communal areas and amenities um, in use and to see if they're lively. Um, and I think that um, when they see a really sort of, uh, the, the guides um, engaging with the residents, then the perception of the scheme is way more positive than if they don't. And actually we find the quality of the, the tour to be really good, but I think as we said here last year, consistency is probably the key, and then um, clearly still some areas for improvement. And I, I think that that's really important that we consider as far as, like Nick, I'd like to pose a question to you about, you know, 
you're really great. Your team is amazing about placing the right people with the right organizations. But as you're talking to prospective employees and working through the recruitment process, how are you working with your clients about training, yeah. um, career progression, which obviously a mystery shop feeds directly into? I think that's it. I think when you get the results from the mystery shop, it's actually, you can create targeted training as a result. And it's no secret that one of the biggest reasons why people leave their roles is um, the lack of training. So I have a stat here. Uh, LinkedIn do a workplace survey and they found 94% of respondents would still be with the previous company if they had training. Um, so literally those people didn't have any. Um, and why is training good? I mean, it feels obvious, but you know, generally job satisfaction, uh, more engagement, but actually uh, it improves your performance. And a lot of the people that Deborah and Sebastian's businesses are, are tracking um, work and leasing or they're incentivized by the sale of the apartment. So training and development leads to more sales. It's, um, it's not only a benefit to the employer, uh, but the employee as well. And all those things together will hopefully improve retention. And can I ask as well, I mean, as far as when people are leaving, what are some of the main reasons that they are leaving companies? I mean, look, the, the, a couple of reasons. Wage inflation is a big thing at the moment. People are, are moving for pay rises. I think that's something which, as a sector, we need to work better at. I think if we keep pinching off competitors and going off a very slim talent pool, that will, um, that will put wages even further. Um, but no, as we said, tr lack of training development and opportunities to progress are usually a common reason when we do exit interviews. Thank you. Um, you know, and, and Todd, just curious. I mean, out, out the back of these these mar um, the mystery shops, and you're getting the results. And I know it can be difficult from experience going to your teams and kind of saying, "Hey, look, these are areas for improvement." Um, how are your teams perceiving this? And and how do we actually take away like kind of the wrist slap uh, element if if maybe they didn't perform quite the way that we would expect? <coughs> Yeah, I think that's really, really important. So we do mystery shop, um, and, and we do it on a regular basis. And actually, it's an amazing tool that we're able to use with our teams. And it's not because you want to slap somebody on the wrist for what they didn't do, but we set expectation around what people should be doing. And in many parts of our business, it's easy for us to see what people are doing. We can see if an accountant has done their bookkeeping right. You know, We can see if collections are coming in when, when rent isn't paid. But it becomes a lot harder when you're talking about that customer experience and what happens when they're on a one-on-one -on -one tour with those customers. We don't get as much insight into that. And so we may think that we've set clear expectations and guides around how to behave and what we expect, but we don't necessarily have a way of saying, can we see what the results of that are? So these mystery shops give us that opportunity and it gives the team members that opportunity to see themselves where there's room for opportunities and where they really excel, and we use it as that. So it's about, it's not about did you do it right or did you do it wrong? It's about saying, where do we see opportunities, either with an individual, but also as a trend. So some of these stats that you um, read, if I looked at all my mystery shops, I would not be surprised about that. Um, but it allows us to take that information and say, as a group, follow up as an issue. Across the board, follow up as an issue. Either what do we need to do differently as leaders, or what do you need to do differently? How can we give you the right tools? And how can we start supporting the right kinds of training to make that a priority and make a change? But if we don't know that piece of information, there's just no way for us to make a change. And I think what Nick said is so right, that it motivates the teams because they get incentivized for every lease that they get. And if we're saying, look, we're giving you tools and resource to help you do a better job so that you do better on your leasing journey, so you get more money because you're, you're getting more um, leases, that's a good thing for everybody. It's a, it's a good thing for us, it's a good thing for them, um, and it can be a real motivator. So I think it's about taking the shop and really shifting the mindset about, I don't want somebody to see what I'm doing, and more about what can I learn and how can I do better and how can I, how can I become better and how can this teach my peers how to be better. The last thing I'll say um, uh, is that it also allows us to see where we're really shining because on top of the stats that were shared, there's also gonna be a lot of really good things that we start seeing that are happening on a regular basis. And we wanna highlight those things so that people recognize, oh, it's a good thing when I do that. When I ask a closing question at the end of the tour, that's a positive. And, and people are being rewarded for that. So I wanna do that and I wanna learn how to do that better, right? And so um, it allows us to do that as well. And I think that's important because you're actually shining a light on how they bring value to your company. And an inherent part of human nature is that we want to be part of something bigger and know that we're valued. 
in the different areas that we touch. And I, so obviously that's, that's quite important. Um, you know, Deborah, I'd like to touch on something that, it, that you kind of hinted on before, lack of availability within the market. And does that sometimes lead to softening of skills because people take for granted, obviously, that the property bought up, I don't have much to do. Yeah, so I was talking to, um, we don't just work in Bill Trump, I was talking to a, a, a big developer of the <coughs> sale scheme and they referred to help to buy being withdrawn from the market and how they're having to retrain all their sales teams to sell because they haven't had to do it uh, for quite a long time. And I think that we could put the same analogy into build to rent and um, you know, it's fantastic. We've got a very, very strong market at the moment, but um, I've been in the industry long enough to know that we shouldn't rest on our laurels. So we, you know, I think all of us on the panel believe that, um, that it's very, especially at the moment, you know, I get it, the economy is challenging. There's a lot of, um, uh, as someone called it, reshaping of businesses at the moment and challenges around cost um, and spending money. But, you know, and you would say, well, you would say this, wouldn't you? But, but clearly, um, <coughs> training and retention of your team and preparing for when things get a bit tougher, and I think with the, um, the economy and people um, looking at how they spend their money, it is really important. This, you know, lead to lease is a sales process. And although it can be um, quite easy in a strong market, it, it does require certain skills and consistency. And so, you know, I, we really believe that it's really important to keep doing this, being able to track changes, invest in your team, so that when the market does get a bit tougher, that you're in the strongest position. And, and obviously, those developers that have maybe taken their foot off the gas a bit in respect of training for sales, are going to you know have to really step it up now because um, it, you know it, it is this is a sales process and it is a, a, a process that requires consistency. And, and we heard earlier on one of the panels, um, Michael Harrington hit the nail on the head in my perspective, and I believe everybody's here um, that now is not the time to let off of training and investment in your teams. Now, if ever we need to push that forward even more to retain that strong talent and to build those careers and let them know that they are the embodiment of our brand. And so, so Seb, I'd like to ask you, as far as like, you know, companies have their mission statements, all too often, most people don't even know what those mission statements are. How are you working with your clients to embed that mission statement from day one? That's a tricky one, uh, the, the mission vision statement, because sometimes you feel that the CEO of the company did the mission vision statement for a whole company on the train from Guildford to Waterloo and said, here you go, thank you very much, and this is what we're doing now, and please follow. And, oh, where's my team? Sorry, we left them behind somehow. Um, if you start that process, I think it's crucial that your team is part of the mission vision fabric. They need to understand why is it that you do certain things, what is your goal, but not in this very lofty uh, statement, what does it mean for my department? Because the sales department's support of the mission is completely different in engineering or security or concierge. And suddenly you have this disconnect where people either don't know what they're doing, mission vision-wise, or it's kind of a jumbled approach versus you go back and it comes down to training where you, where you have workshops and actually guide people towards that mission vision statement. What is it that your department can support the overarching mission for the company, but you have a part that is critical, but you work in sales or in concierge or in engineering. Um, and I was lucky enough to do this for a developer at the very beginning of the project. And that was a absolute phenomenal experience to actually have a team start at scratch, have workshops and walk and talk them through so that everyone understood how in their department they are carrying the torch of a mission vision statement. Because otherwise, it's just a plaque on the wall or one of those inspirational posters, you know, the, the, the light at the end of the tunnel and, um, you know, mountain scenes and whatnot. And people don't understand that. And I think it's better to have then your team trained in brackets on that, that you guide them so that they really understand and live it. And once they start living it, 
funny enough, it, it starts bleeding into their daily interaction with their customers because you have people that are fully imbued with the mission and vision of your company and they radiate that outwards. And I think that is a huge benefit that is unfortunately not seen as, as such at this point in time. And, and to your point, Catherine, oh, sorry. I was, I was just going to add to that because I'm at a different stage at the moment, obviously, in our process. Um, and, you know, we've been working with how we in the audience um, around setting what our proposition and mission is. And I think it's going to be really interesting to see how we try to embed that in every aspect of our design, every aspect of our thought, process, construction, everything, mm -hmm. to see how that then translates to when we're actually on site and we're operational and see whether actually, you know, that vision and mission, starting from grassroots up all the way through, actually has some massive benefit. And I, I'm, you know, I'm really confident that it will. Um, but yeah, I think it'll be interesting to see, you know, the perspective of grassroots all the way through to delivery. And that's very similar answer to the, the question I was going to ask you about the importance of maintaining reputation in good and bad times. Yeah, well, yeah, you've got to try and maintain reputation regardless of the, what's going on. I think back to training and investing, mm -hmm. I think the approach that we take at John Lewis so far is be, be really clear about what you stand for and where you want to invest and really invest in that, but also be really clear about where you don't want to compete, but you want to match where your, your competitors are and being really clear on that. Don't dilute your, your training and your investment, but just be clear about expectations, both for you as your company, but also your employees, and therefore your residents as well. Yeah. And, and Todd, I mean, obviously you have a lot of experience both sides of the water about building out that pipeline and the loyalty from your customers. Um, and, and obviously this plays an integral part. So as far as maintaining that reputation and building both brand and company, um, you know, I, if, if we can have a little bit about your perspective, I think it'd be great. Yeah, I mean, I, I completely agree with everything that's been said here. It, it is so important, and really, your your brand value is based on what your customers see in that. And what we have recognized very quickly is our most valuable customers are the ones that are shouting about how great we are and how great the building is because they bring in other valued customers. And you'll probably heard a lot of people talking about building community and the importance of having a true sense of community within the communities that we have. And what we find is that community is built when people love where they live, they love the brand, and they love the understanding of what we have to offer, but then they start to share that with others, and, and they create that community as well. Um, and so it, it's so important. I mean, it's just the, it's the core of what we do. Um, it, it's really, really important that people understand exactly what it is you're offering and that you're living up to that promise. And I think the last thing that I'll say is we recognize that you know, we will make mistakes, and there are times that the customer experience falls down, but th there's a process in place to ensure that our teams know what to do when that happens, and how do you have a customer recovery process, and really have a well thought out plan. Um, you know, I, I, I talked about this before, but you know, the, having a, a true customer touch point map where you understand where are those key interactions with the customers, and how do you build that brand loyalty, and how do you build that, that um, behaviors within your team that you expect every single time at certain points um, along the journey. Um, and, and one of those, again, is when, when things do go wrong, then also making sure you've got that same process in place. Thank you. And I, I think you're spot on with that. And you made a, a key point about you know the teams. And I think there, we always have been aware that it's important to get the right team in in the very beginning. And Nick, I'd love to tap into your knowledge and your experience about how you're seeing that trend, how, um, you know, as far as new talent coming in, what kind of skills you're taking yeah. a look for, as well as how you're matching I think we said one thing I'm really proud about Bill Trent is we've grasped this importance of service mm -hmm. and culture. And um, at Devil Smith, we don't just recruit into Bill Trent, we cover the whole real estate market and um, uh, an area of residential build to sell. you think we'd have a lot of crossover in terms of the type of people. I mean, I believe it should be a service led as BTR is looking, but unfortunately it isn't. And I, I look at the way recruitment's done and it's quite messy and a lot of people are coming from within the build to sell sector or it's a pinching up competitors and it's very messy. And I think what we're doing and we can continue to do is actually really take our time to identify people with the right personality traits, the right uh, skill set. And you know, they might not come from property, they might come from you know, hospitality and retail where those people sort of live and breathe customer service. I know there's a, some people are, you know, have an argument that 
uh, you, know, you actually have to have some property skills, and my view is to, to have a balance, really. Um, but yeah, I think it's not taking the lazy approach. Don't go after the competitors and, and bring in new talent, and there's a lot of people out there with uh, world-class skills. And if I can just say one thing, I think when you're hiring your teams, exactly what you said is recognizing what does the person who's gonna represent your brand need to have, what are those characteristics, how can they live out your core values as an organization, and when you're hiring, that's what you're hiring for. Um, skills can be taught, you can teach people all kinds of things. I mean, I've got my team sitting in the back row and I look at all the various places that they have come from um, to form who we are as, as Great Star in the UK, and all different interest, industries, all different backgrounds, but the commonality is that they live and breathe our values and, and who we are as an organization, and, and I think that's just so key in the hiring process. And, and while it might sound soft and, and kind of a fluffy side, it's actually really not. It's integral to the investment performance. And, and Deborah, you know, I mean, from, from your experience, as you've seen some of this performance, some of the higher retention rates on the assets, you know, it, how has that been working with some of your investment clients? So I think that um, uh, we know that the, the, there's two things, that the cost of acquisition of a, of a resident is, is high, and I think um, what we see is it's getting much better understood and, and changing really fast in respect of the, the routes to market. Um, and also, obviously, the, the um, amount of, of um, because of social media, the amount of recommendation and, um, and obviously things like home views is really critical. So your, ability, your, your need to get it right to, in order to deliver your returns is, is really important. And that feeds into keeping your team trained and retained as well. And then, um, obviously, keeping people happy. <laughs> And, and in on site and, and again it's a market thing we're seeing a lot less churn aren't we because there's a lot less availability there's less, less new stock coming into the market at the moment and so again we mustn't rest on our laurels because um, it, it, I mean I can remember when I was at Granger you know a big problem we had was a new building would open and we'd literally see you know um, people moving and, and, and the cost of moving is very low and it, it, it's, not, it's, it's much lower now than it used to be when I was at Granger. So keeping people happy, and it comes back to the, the team, um, is as critical as well. So um, it does all hit the bottom line, whether we're talking about staff retention, the cost of training, or whether we're talking about um, the cost of acquisition of a resident. But it, you know, it, it, in the end, it comes back to money, doesn't it? And, and I think that um, uh, we see uh, the investors being really interested in data and you know some of the data from mystery shopping but we were just in who lives in build to rent this need for data and proof and evidence is becoming more and more important as the industry progresses and matures and this is just one element of understanding the customer experience in order to show the investors particularly that you're you, you know you're using their money wisely and that they're <coughs> going to become more demanding i think Absolutely, and and Seb, you know, I know obviously, yes, you you're heavily involved in build to rent, but also with your hotelier background, um, you know, I think one of the key elements that you do see is that, especially that trend of cannibalization within the market. How do we keep our teams loyal and projecting that brand? That's a tricky one. Um, I think it starts with the hiring process. I think if you hire the right people, and we, we, we touched on that in, in regards of, uh, you know, you can take, train uh, your, your team, but I think you have to have a, uh, an approach that is slightly different from, you know, you put just the CV out. We had, for example, a client um, where we had a market store um, and we, we let them sell coffees, virtual coffees. I was actually with yeah. Nick's team. And it was phenomenal. And we made a point to not understand or learn about the, the CV of the people. We were absolutely in the panel. We didn't know who is who, whether they came from the Claridge's or the Connaught. Like I think we were really creative in terms of where we found people. Some of them were just like the barista at Cafe Nero that we met that morning. And um, you know, you told them about this opportunity and they'd never thought about a career in property and it was actually a, a big pay rise, you know, going from a minimum wage to, I can't remember what it was, uh, but yeah, you're right, I mean, it was weirdly the barista was outperforming the 
it's a boy from Tapal's person, which was hilarious. And, and, and there you have then this mosaic building that Todd referred to, that you hired people, but if you have then the whole team in mind, you mosaic your team based on their capabilities into the various slots, and suddenly the whole team is very dynamic, um, and then you want to work with those people day in and day out. I mean, some days more than others, but uh, by and large, you, s you share the same values because you've been trained along your colleagues, but you understand what is this that is required of you. And I, I think that is a very big uh, glue. It, it's the fact right? that when we invited them to interview the client, I'm just going to say who it is, it's Loader, the Indian developer, uh, they hand wrote uh, invita uh, invitations to the interview by letter to everybody that attended and it's just those little things that people remember and if I remember him saying the site was actually delayed as it, as it always happens and there were 30 people due to start and we had to persuade people to wait a month and I think we only lost two people which is actually pretty unheard of but they had such a good recruitment process that people bought into it and actually were willing, willing to wait. I, I love the fact that you brought up a handwritten note. Um, from experience back in the States, even after everybody switched over to emails, yes, I know I'm dating myself heavily here, but with some of my prior companies, we actually, even though we, yes, we'd send a follow-up email, we would always handwrite a note as well. And you'd be amazed how many people just love that small touch, because all too often, the only thing you're getting in the mail is a bill, let's be honest. Um, so I, you know, I think a couple key takeaways from my perspective also, you know, celebrating performance, um, really showing the value to our teams, trying to instill those, the, the, I guess, the ethos of your company and your brand from the very beginning. Um, and I'd like to open up to the group, if the audience has any questions or feedback. Yes. Hi, I think you can hear from the panel about their opinions on a sales skill versus a more service-led skill, and what your experience has been with either combining those or separating those when they use that process, and what you find works best. If I can answer, um, I think that's a really brilliant question, and it's really interesting. Um, one of the things that I talk to my teams about a lot is a salesperson and a customer service person is the same person, and we need to have them be the same person. Everybody should be selling apartments. Everybody should be taking care of the customer. And in reality, in our business, the sales journey is a customer service journey. Um, it, it's a little different of a, of a process in, in renting an apartment than it is to go out and buy a cup of coffee in that it's a big purchase. People have done a ton of research. By the time they come to tour our building, they probably are selecting between a couple of buildings. They want to live there. It's not about just selling the building. They've already sold themselves on all the marketing we've done, all the calls, all the information they've gleaned. It's really about building rapport, <laughs> understanding who that customer is, what they specifically want, and how we can bring that to them and offer that to them, and then selling exactly what it is we do for them and what kind of community we're going to create. So to me, it's, it's both of those things. It's so key in our industry. You don't want a hard salesperson. You absolutely don't want that. But you also don't want somebody that doesn't recognize that part of the customer service is helping that person find actually the perfect home for them, which is what you're doing. Because they have a lot of different possibilities. And that's the skill is how do I help you find the apartment that is going to be right for you by listening to you, by building rapport, by taking you on the journey, explaining what we do, and then making sure you understand that um, and that we understand what you want and that it's a, it's a correct relationship. And, and from a hotel viewpoint, yes, you have the appointment with the salesperson, but the first person you might actually see from the brand might be the receptionist, who has no sales influence. But if I'm not looking at you in the first place, you have already a black tick against your brand before the sales spiel actually started. So that is then where if you have all the different mission and vision understood across the various divisions, every customer journey matters. And if you're the receptionist, you know, use the name, greet, or do whatever standards you're meant to do, but do them nicely and, and with welcoming attitude. And then the sales team can be handed over to, and you know, then the journey continues. But you don't want to have Mr. and Mrs. Grumpy at the front desk, and then you have your star salesperson. 
you know, you, you sometimes look at the hotel business in, in, in TripAdvisor, how people write back from the hotel to the guest. And if you have time, read them because it's actually happening on home views as well. Not as bad as a hotel where the hotel general manager basically tells the guest you're a lying scumbag and stealing and whatnot. <laughs> Millions of people read that. Well, are you going to that hotel? Probably not. But it's the same on home views when you look at some of those um, comments. And that's so important that everyone understands sales activity is everyone's business. Sorry, I'm going to say one last thing. That's so true. Even on the maintenance side, um, you know, it, it, I had a team member in the U.S. that we were touring the building. He was digging this hole, and we asked him, you know, what are you doing? We, they, we were just curious what he was doing. He's like, oh, well, actually, I'm letting apartments. And we said, well, how are you letting apartments? And this is a true story. And he said, because the sprinkler keeps hitting that window and is leaving a stain, and that apartment won't get left because there's a big stain on the window, and by moving the sprinkler head, um, you know, that apartment now will be rentable. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's customer service, and it's, it's not easy to instill that, but that's, that's the idea. It, it's about the ownership. It's about the accountability and the ownership. I think we're about to get the hook, um, but, and I don't want to stand between um, everybody and the drinks reception, but all I can say is thank you so much to, my, to the panel. You guys have been fantastic. Um, I feel like uh, hopefully everybody took away some really great information, and whether it's you know, surveys for your residents or whether it's the mystery shopping programs, investing in your teams and, and as I said, inspecting what we expect I think is a vital part of what we do. So thank you very much everybody.